doing good, bro. How are you doing? We're doing good. That's great. That's awesome. Here you go. I won't answer your phone. Oh, you won't answer my phone. Here, hand, hand that, put that up with Casey. All right. Oh, that's good. Thank you, bro, for uh, walking through that little bio. Save me some time talking about myself. Because uh, that's all we need is for us to talk about ourselves too much. But testimonies are absolutely important. And everyone should be able to give a testimony in a 60-second elevator, as well as one that lasts maybe a little bit of length of time, to 15 to 30 minutes because God wants us living out our testimony because each one of you is a is a living epistle every day and God wants us showing who we are to others in our life because that's how God works through us to change others lives so anyway as you heard I'm Ron and I, I help to work with, uh, with another brother of mine Dan Ferencamp and guys like Casey to change men's lives at Orchard and so thank you for letting me talk to you today let me get situated here so why is it my primary mission? Because it's God's mission, really, to have the truth of his word penetrate our lives and not just sit there. Just like your gift in the body of Christ is not just to sit there. It's to use your gift in the body of Christ every day. So that's an amen. Yes, that's just lots of loud amen because there is no such thing as a gift of sitting on your can. <laughs> Sorry to inform you about that, but it, it isn't. So, uh, and the second one is, uh, I've handed you out some uh, information. Some of you guys have it. Uh, a little card that for many of us, because we're all kind of a little older, there's a few young people in here. The little card and the big sheet is the explanation for what's on that little card. That way you can see it. Because I'm, I'm seeing challenged as well. And so the little card is something to put in your wallet, but I'll explain that a little bit later. It's an accountability card that... We're trying to initiate at Orchard with our men where men can hold each other accountable. So, the reason why those two things are really important because I honestly believe that obviously the most important thing that Christ left with us when he came to earth was these two, these two things. What? To love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And love our neighbors ourselves. And the second one when he left was, he told the disciples what? Go and make disciples in all the nation, teaching them all he commanded to do. And he modeled discipleship. And so why is it we struggle so much with being disciples ourselves and then transferring that model to everyone else? And why are we so resistant to being disciples? It's so difficult. So I'm telling you, we must live out this relationship. And Paul exampled it really well in all his 13 epistles that he wrote. He modeled the idea that we should be constantly in a Paul, Barnabas, Timothy lifestyle. That is a mentoring, discipling model. Or you could say a Paul, Barnabas, Silas, brothers alongside you, and Timothy, Titus relationship. You should always have someone pouring into you. You should always have brothers you can come alongside you. And you should always be pouring into someone else. Amen. Always. Amen. Always. Yes. And... You guys all know this. You know it inherently as a believer that this is what God's call is for you. Jesus modeled this. He modeled this when he came to earth. Yes, he spoke to big crowds, but basically he was modeling this from the very beginning with Peter, Andrew, James, and John, the 12, the 70, the 120. He was modeling small group dynamics where he poured into them and that equation was then going to explode. So... So that's why that's so important. So, so let's turn, turn with me to, uh, right away. Let's turn with me to Hebrews 3. And we're gonna, our, our scripture today that I want you to really focus on, I'm going to give you a little bit of my testimony, but I want, I want to focus on this passage that, that we're going to do. So it's Hebrews 3, and we're going to cover verses 12 through 19. And so... Um, I would like to say about this is what's incredible about this piece of passage is I'll give you some background to what was before it. Obviously, the first couple chapters in Hebrews are incredible. And in light of what we're going to read here is that what the writer of Hebrews is doing is highlighting some incredible things about Jesus and what he came to do. And I'll even shed some light on this in context that it's not, it's not so much that you know, God gave his only son to die for us as a savior. But it's incredible what's being painted here 
about what, who Christ is. And I'll even, I'll even shed a little more light when I have time to go there. I'm not have time to go to all the passages. But if you guys know anything about uh, what Jesus did, it, setting aside his glory for us to become a bondservant for us, to die for us, to be like us, you should regularly visit Philippians 2, 5 through 11 and Colossians 1, 15 through 22. Or 15 through, yeah, right in those, those section of passage because it highlights exactly what Christ did for us by becoming like us. And existing like us into eternity, even though he is glorified, he will re remain like that. And that's ever more highlighted. What was your Ephesians? Oh, yeah, the verses I gave you is Philippians 2, 5 through 11, yeah. and Colossians 1, 15 through 22. These are incredible sets of passages that Paul brings up that show so much about who Christ, what Christ did. And then it's sandwiched in by Revelation 4 and 5. The incredible idea that who is worthy to open up the Lamb's book of life and call out who are his own, and it's Jesus. And, and frankly, we should be so awed by this. So I, what, I want, what I'm trying to tell you is that we will read this passage in a second here. But each day that we enter in, to our relationship with God, we should be totally awed by our relationship with God because of what Christ did for us. We almost enter into holy ground. And sometimes we are very flippant about our relationship with God. That's why the Beatitudes are so important. Because when you walk through the Beatitudes, the very first one is, I should realize I'm bankrupt in spirit. In other words, I am nothing. I'm a zero. I'm a donut hole without God. And if I don't understand that about myself, then I can't come before him. I can't understand that it's he who draws me anyway, and I am nothing without him. And, and, and then I can understand my sin, which is we're poor, we're, we need to be confess our sin. So the first, actually, the first four Beatitudes are all about being broken and starting over with Christ, and then I'll hunger for thirst for righteousness. I can, go, I can get into a whole Beatitudes thing, but we don't have time. He's, he'll, they'll shorten my time here. I'll have you here all day. But you get where I'm kind of going with this. You can understand my direction. Understanding what our relationship with God is and who he is. It's huge. And so I point out these passages, go to them, understand it regularly, have a picture of it, understand even Revelation 5 and who the glory of our God is. John just gets such a great picture of it. And you go, you should be in awe of it. And it helps you even walk through how your brokenness should be before Christ every day as you enter it. So if that makes sense. So... I want you to understand the truth of God's word and how it should transform you and then why you need accountability, which we'll get to at the end. So let's read. Let's read. Does that make sense a little bit? Am I making sense to you or did I move too fast? Okay. So let's read. Hebrews 3, verse 12 through 19. And the context here is a little bit, after he explained all that, who Christ is, a little bit about the Israelites and how we can share that. And we, we share that whole kind of vision today. So here it is. Verse 12, take care, brethren, lest there should be any one of you evil, an, any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they, heard, when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came, came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they should not enter his rest? But to those who were disobedient. And so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. We're going to break that down in a minute. So what was my, what's my life about? And we got a little brief thing about my testimony. Uh, I come from a broken family. Uh, my, I came from Indiana. I was the oldest of three kids. And my dad was a jazz pianist, a a famous local guy in Elkhart, Indiana, right around Notre Dame. And uh, I was a high school kid, meaning I was born, I was conceived in high school. 
And my dad was the famous musician. And my mom was the high school uh, cheerleader. And uh, so I was actually born when she graduated. And uh, because my dad wanted to still be this famous musician, uh, eventually I'll cut to the chase. He, uh, in his early years, he traveled around with Johnny Cash and other famous musicians on the road, and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and all those guys. He decided to make his way to where, the Hollywood fame. So he came out early, came to Hollywood, played Sunset Strip and all that. And, and my mom and t my siblings traveled by train to make it here to Hollywood where we had no place to live. I didn't know this till later. It was told to me that my dad wasn't really ready for us to come. But we, th there we arrived. And, uh, and now I know why it was kind of a mess. I, 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 you know, I'm five years old when we came. And it was kind of a messy life. As a result of this kind of messy life, uh, my dad playing gigs everywhere, he also got played. In other words, he played the lifestyle. And within a few short years, uh, my parents were separated and eventually divorced, leaving my mom to carry the load. As a result of a lot of this stuff, it, I became the oldest sibling that took care of my brothers and sister. And it left me with a high kind of like responsibility ratio. I don't know. And, and that, that in me carried a lot of weight. Uh, my dad not always being there. And she always working two jobs. I ended up watching my siblings a lot by myself. Even though we lived in crappy apartment buildings and things like that. I never knew that then, you know, living in places. But I was always, I actually was left alone a lot. Didn't know. And it carried some kind of, uh, I don't know, something in me that either made me more responsible, but also lacking trust in adults. So after dating several men and not seeing adults as trustworthy, my mom got the idea that she should go to church. She was raised a Methodist. If you don't think about Methodists in the Midwest, they don't. Say, they don't preach that you need to be born again or anything like that. But we went to a really good church at the time, First Baptist Church in Van Nuys. At the time, that was near uh, uh, Grace. And it was also near Church on the Way, Jack Hayford's church. Really thriving church. Harold Fickett Jr. was the pastor. There was like 7,000 members. It was a huge growing church where I got plugged in, even as a young person. And at 10 years old, I came to know Christ at a small camp called Forest Home, in San Bernardino Mountains, where my Sunday school teacher named Bruce Wilson, I always remember his name, uh, led me to Christ. And it was awesome. And it transformed, obviously, my life because it transformed my heart. And I began trusting adults again. And that's pretty much the 411 on that. But what happened in the ensuing years is I got poured into. And it changed my whole outlook on adults. Even though I lacked trust in my mom and my dad and other adults, I began seeing that adults were worthy of trust again because of Jesus. And it was awesome. It was an awesome time. Youth pastors, so I pray for my youth pastors a lot because I had, was poured into and discipled by my youth pastors through junior high and high school, and it was an awesome time. So, life was full of miraculous things. I, I met the love of my life then. I met her as 12 years old, fell in love with her then. And later on as a 20-year-old, we fell in love for real, and we got married when I was in the service. And so uh, we've been married 44 years. I've known her like 51 years. We have three great children. And we've seen a lot of miraculous things happen in our life. And without going into a lot of details, it's been somewhat of a roller coaster ride, as all life is, isn't it? But we've seen God's handiwork in our lives. And I haven't always followed God in that life. I've followed a pattern of different things through different churches I've been in, trying very hard to, to walk a path that was maybe of my own doing. The struggle I've had much of my life is a little bit like maybe many of you. And what I mean by that is I struggled a lot with self-righteousness, thinking that I could please God. Maybe that was how I was raised, had to be, uh, care for my brothers and sisters. I struggle with saying I need to please God, do the right thing. And that is almost like heroin. 
if you understand what I'm saying, the path of self-righteousness is almost like a drug. You think you can please God and it always ends up in failure. And so some of that path is difficult because you can never be fully right before God until you relent and give in to say, let the Holy Spirit be in charge of your life. And I'm not saying it was always that way, but I know that there, I can earmark and look back at my life's walk and understand that many times that's what I was doing. I was displeased with the struggle I had in life because I was feeding off the drug that Ron could do it himself. Ron could be right himself if I just did these things. Even if I walked by principles, the law, even though I knew it wasn't the law, I still followed the law of some sort in my own head. And it's like feeding off of a drug that never satisfies. And so that met up with some failure in my life that became like a drug. And that failure turned into when I retired, uh, getting hooked on Oxycontin because I had a bad surgery, turning to porn, and struggling with self-worth. And that only got solved when I was in a discipleship group and some other men where I had to bury some of these, bury self-worth, bury self-righteousness, bury, finally, bury whatever that, that came, cropped up in my life like porn and things that I had turned to because I could not satisfy this need to be right. And funny thing is, all of you have some of these things in your life. You struggle with anger because you got something hidden in your life in the closet that you're not getting, you, you, you're, uh, that you're uh, struggling with. You think, well, why am I upset? Why do I have things in my life that I can't, quite can't get right with God? Because you're still holding on to these things. And so I'm going to get to something here that says you're struggling with things because you fully have not resolved some things in your life. Anger with a relative holding on to something with a brother. You're still toying with pornography. You may, be, you may be off drugs, but you're still hooked on drugs of some sort. You're hooked on something in life because you have no accountability in your life. All of you think that you can still live as an island in your walk with Jesus, and you can't. Because failure, if it hasn't happened, is coming. You can't walk with Jesus by yourself. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says you can't go on living by yourself. You have to be in the fellowship. And that, and I'll read some scripture. This scripture even points to it, that we have to be accountable. We all worry so much about getting the log out of our own eye that we can't help our brother with the speck in his eye. But that scripture Jesus is talking about in Matthew 7 is all about, yes, getting the sin out of our, lie, our, our, own, our own lives, but helping our brother with the speck. All of us need accountability. So I'll get into that just a little bit here. So, so what changed for me? What, what, as, you, as you heard, what, what are the things that changed for me? Well, I determined I would never, I would not go this route anymore. And I've done this several times through promise keepers in the 90s and different things. But my determination, my self-worth and determination, what does it amount to? Not a hill of beans. Not a hill, it's a donut hole. You can white-knuckle your way through any kind of program. You can follow the seven steps and the 15 guides on Amazon book that you bought, and it still amounts to zero because you can't do it on it. You can white-knuckle your way through, through, through AA's principles, and it won't get you anywhere without what? Without Jesus, without the Holy Spirit. You, I'm not saying God can't work through AA. I'm not saying God can't work through some 15 steps to better living because God does use those things. But I would never recommend AA to anyone. I would recommend CR. Why? Because it's based on a real God, not the, not the unknown God. Amen. You get where I'm going? You understand where I'm going with this? Okay. Because I've seen AA for years. And by the way, my dad got saved through AA, even though he followed AA for years. But AA doesn't work because they, they, half the time they're replacing it with something else. The unknown God. I'm so sick of that thing. Uh, they're all in there smoking and doing whatever and faking it. Because they're white knuckling their way through some principle. There's only one God. 
We know this. Yes. And it's Jesus Christ. Amen. And he's the only one who saves. And people who are recommending there's better power through positive thinking. I, oh, I'm so sick of the, the shenanigans. People are dying for the truth. It's like the truth is like the, people want it so bad they will go to a desert. And I'm not saying anything new you haven't heard, but they, it's like they, they're parched for the truth. They're, and they want it. They want it, they want it so bad. And you're supposed to be there to tell them about the truth. Men are still men and women are still women. And it's just a bunch of bunk that, that we're even saying that a man can have a baby. It's just like, what? It's just baloney. So you got to be willing to stand up and, and, and be counted. So anyway, I didn't, that, that's off the tail. That's, that's a freebie there. But... Uh, so my determination doesn't amount to anything. Only the Holy Spirit. That's what grace is. And so we must never sell grace short. That's cheap grace. That's a freebie too. That's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. No cheap grace. Because the full package of grace is what? That I'm not just a hearer of the word, James, but I'm a doer of the word. There's evidence in my life. Yes, I believe once saved, always saved, with evidence in my life. We're selling something short when we just say to people, oh, all you do is say the prayer, you're good. No, you're not good. That's not good enough. Okay, that's not good enough. Because if there's no evidence in my life, you're not saved. I'm sorry. That's not real. I don't make that determination. God does. He'll, on judgment day, he'll make that determination, won't he? I don't, that's not for me. That's Jesus Christ. But he certainly will be counting on those. Because wide is the way to destruction and narrows the way to the kingdom, to eternal life. That's right. And few will find it. Now, that's not my words. That's Jesus' words. And you must understand that, that you got to be the few who are pointing others to that way. So, so how do we mix things up so badly in our life when we're walking? How do we screw up verses like Romans 8, 28? All things work together good for those who called and, uh, according, to his according to his purpose. How do we mess that up? Why do we think everything's good? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. Why do we mix those verses up? Why do everyone have them on their mantelpieces and we're all going, oh, that's an awesome verse. Why? Because we come to God in our terms. We think everything's going to work out to be good. I'm going to have a hunky-dory life. I'm going to have four cars in the garage, not just two, four, and a boat, and, and, and all going to be good, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why do we mess this up in our life, and then when stuff hits the fan, and we get cancer, and everything's going on, well, I thought everything's going to work out to be good, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When that looks like I'm in struggling in pain, and my, my kid just died because he got hit in a car accident, and I don't have the answers. What do I tell people now about my faith? How, how did I mess these, these verses up that I got on my mantle? What do you do then with the word good? And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's because we totally misunderstood what God's call in our life is and what, what grace means. So, let's break down Hebrews again. Let's look at this. So, each of us are called to do something in our life. And because sin reigns in our DNA until God brings us home, and grace is not just about the salvation, because God did justify us for the Father, and we're made holy, and he's sanctifying us through our whole life. He's testing us to grow us to be like him, and one day we'll, we'll be me glorified again. He wants us to do something with each other. So here it is. Take care, brother, lest there be any one of you evil, unbelieving heart, and falling away from the living God. So we're believers. He's talking to believers here. We could fall away. We could struggle with our belief. That happens then. But encourage one another day after day as long as it's still called today. At least any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Do you see this? Sin, which reigns in us still, can deceive us. It's going to deceive us. So how do we prevent that from happening? Okay. For we become partakers, so for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance until the end. We've got to hold fast. What's going to keep us from doing that? If we're an island out here and we're, we're doing our faith by ourselves, we're going to fail. 
And so what's it saying we should do? Today, if you hear my voice, do not be hardened by our hearts as they, they provoke me. Now, he's talking about entering into the rest as the Israelites did. Some of us are going to really struggle with this. It's possible some of you aren't going to enter into God's rest if you get hardened by your heart and your own sin. You're going to just die on the vine. The struggle you're going to have is you're going to remain an island because you're not listening to the Holy Spirit's prodding in your life. That's why we need each other to provoke each other to, 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 to good deeds. You've got to be the... You've got to spur each other on to good deeds. It's important. And you know when your brothers are falling away and you, if you're walking every day in, in the Holy Spirit's prod in your own life, you can see it in other brothers. But you don't say anything. Why? Because we're not transparent. We live this iceberg principle life where we only show 10% or 20% of our life and the rest of it's hidden. We should be more transparent with each other. And so that's what accountability is all about. Having someone in your life. I have someone in my life. I got several men in my life who <laughs> call me out. But I have one especially who knows me well, who tells me I'm full of shenanigans. And that's what these accountability cards are all about, where I meet with him regularly, and I know him, and he knows me, and we ask, how's it going? What's happening with you? What's happening with that thing that's your thorn in your flesh? How are you doing with your walk with God? How are you doing with your wife and your kids? How are you doing your ministry life? Are you living the Paul Barnabas Timothy lifestyle? How's work going or retired life going? Are you, do you have a lot of idle time? Are you pouring into others? And the last part, a lot of it's like, did you just lie to me about a lot of these things? That's the last question we ask. Are you lying to me now? You know? Have you looked at porn this week? Are you drinking? What's the problem that you have that's your, your issue? Why, why are you angry? Because there's usually other things in your life that you're angry about that are a cause of being angry. You know? Why are you short? Because you don't walk in the spirit? You don't know how to, don't know how to live the other-centered life? So. So. What's, what's, what, what I'm really trying to drive at here is that God doesn't want us to be living this satisfied, sit in our can, soft life. It's, it's, it's coming to God on our terms. And, and we've totally misunderstood. We, we, we want tickling ears. We, we want soft preaching. We want nice worship. We, we want to be comfortable. It, it's natural for us. Oh, yeah, we want to go in. The carpet's nice and everything. And... It, we want all those things, but that's not what it's about. We probably need to be uncomfortable. I'm not saying go and just be uncomfortable, but you should be asking probably every day, regularly every week, what's God doing in my life right now? What, not on my terms, on his terms. That's your relationship with him. So there's some non-negotiables that you always stick with. The non-negotiables are I should have a living, active relationship with God the Father, his son through the power of his Holy Spirit. And that's my non-negotiable. I have that relationship. And I should be in his word every day. If I'm, every day. It's non-negotiable. Every day I should be reading his word. Yes. Yes. My phone's over there, but my goodness, I, we know that's a problem. But everybody's flipping through the phone all the time. We're, getting, we're reading that more. Now, I've got some Bible apps on that thing. And I've got a lot of things that I read on that. But frankly, this thing right here, uh, the printed one, the printed version, where you can do notes in it, and write, I recommend people do that. The King James Version, the New King James Version, the NASB, uh, the ESV, those are good versions. And let the sound of the turning page. The turning page. I recommend, I recommend the versions that are, you know, word-for-word -word translations. Okay? None of those... Soft translations that are thought for thought. I'm sorry. Maybe the Holman Bible. That's about as close as you're going to get. Maybe the Holman Bible. After that, you guys should stay away from it because you're misunderstanding God's word. So I, I don't get too far on that. You need some. And then after that, the non-negotiables are have accountability in your life. 
Someone should be checking on you. Are you staying true to the things you, hold, you, you say you promised to do? Because guess what? What does it say in James 1, 22 through 25? What does it say in James? It says, be, prove yourselves doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, who delude themselves. Because why? When I look in the mirror, I see that I look, I think, oh, I look marvelous. And I walk away, and what? I got boogers hanging out in my nose. I'm a booger-eating moron. We're, we're schleps. And we, we need brothers to tell us, hey, you got boogers hanging out of your nose. Don't you know that? But we walk around thinking I look marvelous because I will lie to myself. We are born liars. We per we're pretenders. And when we get in groups as men, what happens to us, we love to tell stories about how I caught, how I caught the pass in 1942 that saved the championship. Now, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. We're, you know, that's great. I, I do, too. I, I love to say, oh, yeah, I ran the mile and such and such, and I shot the winning basket. This is, this is great. It's fun, but it's baloney. L listen, I, I think, and, and it's funny, we laugh a lot. Casey and I, I'm, I'm talking, turning to Casey here, but sometimes we think in our, in our, our fellowship, we say sarcasm is our love language, <laughs> and, and I got to wrap it up, but... Sometimes sarcasm can even go a little too far. Our love language should be that we care so much about our brothers that we're willing to be in their life, to, be, to encroach in their life. So let me wrap it up here with a few things. Be willing to walk in your life in a way that it's uncomfortable. God says our faith should be tested. So here it is. The last thing I want to leave you with is James... We saw that already in, in Hebrews, right? In order to be in God's rest, to be there, to cross the Jordan, we sang the song of it, to cross the Jordan, to enter into God's full rest, we're going to have to be willing to stay the course in the end. So here it is, James 1, 2 through 4. Consider all, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So testing your faith. So 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. Huge here. In this you greatly rejoice, rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor in the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Philippians 3, 7 through 9. Let me read this one, and then we'll try to wrap this up. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted at law. As loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. What I want to leave you guys with is this. The life is about testing. It's like the blacksmith. He tests the iron over and over again by pounding away at it and then, then quenching the, uh, the iron so that it can have a good sharp edge. He quenches it at the right temperature so you can create an edge to it. We're constantly being tested by fire and quenched at the right temperature so what? So, so that we can be tested. So we can have a, create a good edge that we can be used properly. And that's what we do as brothers, don't we? Iron sharpens iron. Is that Psalm 27, 17? 20, do I have that right? 27, 17? And, and so that's what God is doing with us. And so, I need you guys to understand that life is about constantly being tested and quenched over and over again until he makes us sanctified like him. The last scripture I'm going to read to you, 1 Peter 12 through 19. It was real to them that they were not serving themselves, but... Serving themselves, but, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, heaven things into which angels long to look. Therefore, gird your minds in action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace 
to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which you were yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves as in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. I think I went to the wrong scripture. No, it is it. That's it. Because it is written, you should be holy because I am holy. And if you address as your father the one who is impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in the fear of the, in fear of the time of your stay upon earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood of the Lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Jesus Christ. That, that's First Peter uh, 1. I was supposed to read 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19, but that, that was it. That was a good one too. But I was, I was supposed to read chapter 4, but I guess I was. But God wants us to look forward to the day of Jesus Christ coming, that we are supposed to be, uh, look forward to the, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I was supposed to read chapter 4, 12 through 19. But let me wrap it up by saying, do not be upset with the testing of fire. You're growing in that. And I didn't get as much into the accountability card as much as I should have. But what that is there for you to do is get with another man. Pray about being with another man who's going to hold you accountable to the things you promised God you would do in your life. The non-negotiables in your life. That you have a relationship with him. An active, growing relationship, prayer life. And that you are in his word. And in that accountability card, it starts off with uh, a few things. Like, what plagued you this week? What sin's bothering you? And what, was, what were you blessed with this week? And then it goes into the ACTS acronym, if you've already heard that. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. And that's that, your spiritual life. I use that daily in my life. And then it goes into a few things. Your, your, your ministry life, your work life, your home life, and, uh, and some other things in your life. Read that through. And then use that as a guide. Just use it as a guide for your, bro your brother who cares about you for eternity. And that's the idea behind that. Thanks for letting me share it with you. I know I threw a lot at you. And I talk fast and maybe it don't make sense sometime. But I hope, hope uh, you guys do that. Hope you find a brother who will hold you accountable and help you walk in Jesus. Amen.